time. Uh, Neil's just asked me to remind you we're going to be running some um, a, a course for new people on Sundays. And I've forgotten the dates because you didn't tell me in advance. There's a sign-up sheet at the back. If you've joined us since the pandemic and you want to find out what we're all about, there's a sign-up sheet at the back. Talk to somebody more sensible than me. I'm going to press my time because that wasn't coming out of my time. Although I know that we've all got something on this morning. Good morning. I'm going to assume that when you're staring at your phones with a look of excitement or stress, you're looking up scriptures to check that I'm not talking rubbish, not watching the match. If we score, feel free to let a hallelujah go so we can all join in the excitement. But if they score, don't react. Just put me off. I'm wearing an England shirt this morning. I'm wearing an England shirt because I want to show my support for the Lionesses this morning. But also because of the weird thing that happens when we watch team sport. We actually imagine that we're somehow influencing what's happening on the field by wearing the shirt. And shouting advice at the TV. They can't hear us. They can't hear us when we shout at the TV, just so you know. Before I even got into the building this morning, I was stopped by Rowena, who stated categorically that Barnsley would have won yesterday if she hadn't had to be at a wedding. <laughs> and she believes it. I've got to break some really tough news to you this morning. Even if somebody drops out of the team and you're in the crowd with the right shirt on, the manager's not going to come and set you. Come on, have a kick for us. Especially when you're watching it on TV. You see, just wearing the right shirt isn't enough to make you a sports person. There's the small matter of training, discipline, sacrifice, dedication, hard work and talent, all of which are essential if you want to play sports. So I've gone off football now. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I love football so I don't have to run around, kick a ball, or do any exercise, frankly, at my age. This morning, I want to look at some verses in Hebrews. I'm going to read from chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. I've got a short reading, but I really want to dig into this this morning. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I love these verses, and I've certainly spoken about them before, but life brings me back to them again and again and again. Again and again and again, I come back to this scripture. And that's because again and again and again in life, I find that when it's tough going, and I need to keep going. The thing I need to do is look to Jesus. When I was preparing, I read a com commentary. I know, we do these mad things as speakers. We actually study. And it said that these two verses talked about two of the main duties of the Christian life. And the first was preparatory, which means that we have to do some work ourselves before we can move on to the next steps. Hebrews tells us that we have to lay aside every weight that slows us down. And we need to lay down our earthly desires and sins. And the second duty is perfective. I love this. We have to run the race. We have to live out our faith in actions, not just words. Getting better at it the more we practice it. See, I like this. First of all, I like it because I love alliteration. I love it when two key words start with the same letter. It ticks my literature box. Yay, alliteration. And I love it because it's true. You see... We have to throw off the stuff that stops us living our Christian lives to the full before we can live our Christian lives to the full. The writer to the Hebrews, generally attributed to be Paul the Apostle, is painting a picture. And in these verses, he's talking to a church and he's giving them an image that they would easily understand. You see, the word that we translate as race is agwon. Nobody's checking the dictionaries now. Which means a gathering, a contest, a struggle, a conflict, a fight, an opposition, or a race. Am I wrong?
Oh, does that sound a bit like football? It's more like football than a flat race, certainly. This is a team thing, surely. See, the words associated with a place of assembly, especially a place of contests. So Paul's actually talking about an arena or stadium where games are taking place. So, you know, imagine like Paul's talking about the Colosseum and gladiators mixed in with all the athletic stuff that went off there too. You see, I think Paul chooses this image to demonstrate how we should live our lives openly, demonstrating our faith, being real about our struggles. I'm not sure that I like the idea of people seeing how I deal with difficulty, to be honest. But there's a difference to me living my life out in the church to a gladiator in an arena. You see, in a public stadium, the crowd might be either for or against the athletes or gladiators or whatever get sport they're playing, the footballers. I was listening to the semi-final, England v the Aussies, the, on the radio in the cafe. I did check with the boss that he was okay with that. Normally when you listen to a match, you know something's happening because the crowd noise goes up. It was really weird because whenever we had the ball, when we were attacking their net, there was no crowd noise. The Aussies were like, yeah. not saying anything. And every time they had the ball and were coming to us, it was deafening. You couldn't hear the commentators. The crowd that we live in our lives out in front of isn't like that. The crowd of witnesses is for us, yeah. not against us. The crowd of witnesses at a football match are real and loud. Imagine the noise in the stadium. What time have we got to? Okay, it's going to be pretty noisy in there already. Imagine the noise as the lionesses are hearing right now as they play. Be incredible. But our crowd are for us, not against us. We're surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses, cheering us on, not waiting for us to trip up. Not waiting for the back pass that ends up in the back of the goal so they can go, ah! I only thought about this when we were worshipping as well. Imagine this. Imagine a football crowd that are one in heart, because they're all supporting the same team, and can all sing. Singing God's praises. That would be a sound. Because like, even like a load of idiots in a football match sound good because there's thousands of them. Yeah. Imagine. Imagine what our crowd sounds like. I like that crowd. You see, I've imagined this race that we're talking about for years in lots of different ways. I've thought about it as a marathon or as a relay race where one generation passes the baton to the next. I've thought about it on as one of those horrific cross-country cross runs that my sadistic sports teachers were fond of. <sighs> Do you know why they did that? Do you know why they set us out on cross-country runs? So they'd go have a brew and wait for us to come back. They didn't care where we went. They didn't check. It was just class. Go out and run for an hour. Come back looking muddy. I just rolled in a puddle and waited in a bush and went back. It's just like... What a pointless, pointless exercise. <laughs> See, I've sometimes felt that my race was solitary, a personal struggle to get to the finish line, and that nobody was watching anymore. Even the crowd had just gone, that's too painful, I'm not watching. Have you ever watched a sports match where you just think, oh, I can't watch this? <laughs> oh, no, it's just too painful. No, oh, why did you bowl that ball there? I can't watch anymore, I'm going... I have. There's one of the two really painful sporting experiences. Can't watch penalties. I cannot watch penalties. I have to leave the room. See, sometimes I've felt like my life was like that. Like, like the crowd couldn't bear to watch me fail the penalties. And they'd all gone. Gone for a brew and I'm just stood there going. Throughout my Christian life, there have been times I've taken my eyes off the prize. And lost ground. But there have been people from church who didn't let me slip away. You see, I've always thought of the cloud of witnesses as those who've gone before, urging me on from heaven, telling me to hang on and I'll make it through somehow. And I think that's partly what Paul's saying, because all of our lives are a small part of a much bigger picture. We're all part of a race which continues when we've finished our bit. There's a sense of the heavenly crowd of witnesses urging us on. 
But we can forget that the great cloud of witnesses includes those who are running the race alongside us right now. A witness is just somebody who sees something happening. You're part of the great cloud of witnesses right now. You see, it struck me when I was preparing this that some of the greatest encouragements I've experienced in my life have happened either in this room or over in Blucher Street. Just as an aside, I was talking to Naomi earlier, at least one of my witnesses in heaven is strongly disapproving of the wearing of a football shirt <laughs> while speaking. I can feel the waves of disapproval beating down on me. See, the encouragement I've received from a great crowd of witnesses has mostly come from friends, leaders, musicians, speakers, younger people, older people, basically everyone in the church. Basically, if you're here and you can see how I'm doing, you can choose to encourage me in my race. And actually, there's another thing that we can do for each other too. In the bits of my race where I've thought about giving up or gone off course or started looking back or straying after something shiny or gone, squirrel! <laughs> Some of those witnesses who were close to me have corrected me and kicked me back into line. And some... I've taken hold of my hand and walked alongside me when I couldn't run anymore. We're the great crowd of witnesses too. Yeah, we're being cheered on from heaven. But this isn't a me race. This is an us race. If it's a race, I was thinking about this. I didn't put it in my notes because I thought, oh, I, don't, I don't really want to credit my mate Pat who's bonkers with anything. <laughs> But actually, my mate Pat, who's bonkers, has done all kinds of sporty stuff in his life, including wheelchair racing after he had a massive um, stroke, effectively. He calls it something else, I won't tell you what that is. <laughs> but he was in the Navy, and he used to take part in a race at a tournament where him and his squad dismantled the cannon, carried it across the stadium over a load of obstacles, and put it all back together. That's more like the race we're in, because we're in it together. We're in it together. We've got a job to do. And when we work together to do that job, we're more effective. Do you get the picture? Our race as Christians isn't individual. It's not a solitary affair. We're partnered with others. We're part of the church locally, globally. And here's the really amazing one. Throughout all of history. We're in the crowd of witnesses already. Let's think about what the commentary called our preparatory duty. The verses tell us, let us throw off. Let us, not you, throw off. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. It's much easier to run a race if you're not carrying lots of stuff. Marathon runners tend not to carry extra weight if they can help it, unless they're Paul raising money for the hospice <laughs> in full armour. You see, carrying extra weight slows you down. It makes it harder. It makes it tougher. You see, there's a, a distinction between everything that hinders and sin, which easily entangles. You see, here's a problem. Sometimes things which are not bad things, things which are not sin, can still hinder us. Let's think about this. Things which appear to be good things can take our attention away from faith. There's a definite difference between going good things and God things. I've met lots of lovely people who are trying really, really hard to do nice things all the time. But real transformation requires our good, needs, good deeds to be combined with the empowering work of the Holy Spirit to be effective. That's the difference. You see, we can get involved in all kinds of social action projects, but unless we carry God's heart in the way we try and help people, we won't impact lives long term. Sometimes the extra weight we carry isn't our weight at all. Sometimes the extra weight we carry are the misplaced expectations of family, friends, society, culture, and all the other general noise of life. Sometimes our lives aren't good enough because we haven't got the right shirt on, because we can't afford Nike or whatever. 
Cultural expectation is a weight that we sometimes carry. I once had a conversation with a very educated, well-qualified, professional gentleman who said, in some ways, he was envious of the freedom I had. And I asked him, why? Well, I went, what? Because he was somebody I admire very much. And he said that because he came from a privileged background, he'd been expected to go to university, he'd been expected to take up a responsible professional job and expected to earn a good living. And he wanted to do all kinds of daft stuff. And he didn't do it because of his education and his birth. And he said that because I was from an ordinary background, I'd got all the choices in front of me. I could choose to be who I wanted. I could choose to do something daft or something solid. That was my choice. See, at the time, I wasn't sure that I was the one who got the better deal. But now I'm older and possibly wiser. Not the possibly. I actually think he was on to something. Because when you're not carrying people's expectations of you, you're freer to be the person you are. See, sometimes we need to throw off negative things that have been placed on us by others. As I followed my brother, the perfect one, the golden boy, the sportsman, through school, there was nearly two years' age difference between us and a single school year apart, so I got a constant cry of, oh, you're not as smart as your brother. Oh, you're not like your Steve, are you? Oh, no, you're not as good as your brother. Oh, you're not your brother. No, I'm not my brother, I'm Joe. Live with it. Church, what matters in your life is not what anybody else has ever said about you, good, bad, or downright hurtful. What matters is that you're a child of God. You're running your race, you're facing life's struggles, conflicts, oppositions, and frailties alongside a great cloud of witnesses who will walk with you when you're limping. Let's move on and think about perfective. I'm going to admit that even though I'm a bit wordy, I had to look this up. Because I've never really heard it before. It, you can use it as like, it's, it's a grammar thing as well, but it means tending to make perfect, becoming better. So if you remember the commentary said that two of the duties of Christian life were preparatory and perfective, you see, we call to put off the things that hinder us, which often boils down to our past negative experiences or our sinful nature. And to strive to become better and be perfect. Don't panic. The perfection bit isn't on us. Let me explain. We're made perfect because Jesus is perfect. He paid the price for our sin. He's covered our weakness and clothed us in strength. In him we are holy and whole before God. And when we see him, when our race is finished, we'll be perfected. So what does this mean for us? Hebrews tells us, um, in another verse in Hebrews said, and let, it, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The word we translate as perseverance is hupomone. I did better with that one because it kind of, you know, it bounces a little bit which is characterized as a patient, enduring, sustaining perseverance. Another commentator writes that this word is the characteristic of one who is not swerved from a deliberate purpose and loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. I love that. What they're saying is don't grit your teeth, get your head down and do it in your own strength. They're saying be loyal. Be loyal to your faith, because when you are, that's the thing that's going to carry you through. That's where your endurance comes from, not from who you are and how much you can dig up to get on. It's where are we going. It's what we've been given. On my Christian journey, I've met people who've shown great perseverance in the face of great trials and sufferings, and I'm proud to call them friends. And the odd thing is that they're strangely joyful people. You see, in the fiercest storms of life, we can experience the peace of God in a tangible way. Our ability to persevere isn't dependent on our own strength or our willpower or our ability to grit our teeth and push through. Our ability to persevere in this race we call life is dependent on God's strength, on his will, and on the victory that Jesus won for us on the cross when he pushed through the pain of separation from his father to kick down the gates of hell. 
Arroz. So how do we get through the contest, the struggle, the conflict, the fight, the opposition that we call a race? We persevere by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. You see, Jesus has gone before us. He's our example. He's our champion. He's our pioneer and perfecter. There's nowhere we can go. He hasn't gone ahead of us. And when we wander off and do our own thing or even do the wrong thing, he's still there. All of our sin and shame is known to him. We cannot hide it from him because he knows it. Because he covered it. Because he conquered it. Hebrews tells us, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured because of the joy set before him. And the joy was that man would be made right with God. The joy set before him was the church. The joy set before him was you. Why can we be joyful in the midst of suffering and grief? Because Jesus is our joy. And even when life is tough, we can choose to see Jesus above our struggles. Verse 3 of Hebrews 12 tells us, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When we're in danger of losing heart, when we feel like quitting, remember, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. When we need direction and we're feeling lost, we tend to walk towards the thing you look at. You ever been lost on the moors? Like properly on the moors, like up the top and those like hateful Christian long walks that I went on because <laughs> you were given a Bible and a set of boots and expected to somehow be like outdoorsy. Funny, really, because I'm outdoorsy, so I'm kind of making it up. I really enjoyed them, I suppose. But the, the great sermon fodder. You get on the top of the moors, and when you were lost, all you got was like your map and your compass direction. So you'd have a look and think, well, we should be going there, or we'll, we'll walk towards that. What's nearly there? Well, that tree's nearly there. Well, let's just keep our eyes on that tree, and then we'll take another bearing when we get to the tree. And then you'd find out you're like a few. Yeah. yeah. We walk towards the thing we're looking at. Yeah. If you're lost, Fix your eyes on Jesus. You'll walk towards him. You see, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, it doesn't stop all the stuff that's happening around us from happening. Sorry. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the mountain we're facing doesn't shrink. Sorry. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, grief doesn't melt away. Sorry. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we find the courage to climb the mountain in front of us. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we find comfort, even in our distress. I guess this morning I was struck by the fact that every time I gather with Christians, I'm part of a great cloud of witnesses. I want to be encouraged in my race, my contention, my fight. And the best way I can be encouraged is to remember to encourage the people around me. Because do you know that actually kindness is contagious? Let's encourage each other, church. Encouragement works both ways. When you realise you made somebody else feel good, you feel good, yeah. genuinely. Yeah. But this morning especially, I want to honour the people who spurred me on for the last 40 years. Some are still part of my life and some have moved away. And some have reached the end of their races and found perfection. Can I get the band back, please? I think in our lives as Christians, it's good to honour the people that spur us on. And there are people in this room that spur me on. Thank you. So just as the band get themselves settled, just take a moment to thank God for your crowd of witnesses, for the people that have kicked you on and kept you moving. Ruth, thank you. I don't know what this week is going to be like. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. I don't know the beginning from the end, but he does. So this morning, let's sing again and let's worship our fantastic God. I'm just going to pray before I get off and give it back to the band. Lord, this week, help us to know that we're in a race together. 
that we're for each other and that heaven's for us too. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that we would encourage and build each other up, that we might fix our eyes on you and move together towards our goals in you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>